Good afternoon and welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. It is January 6th and we are continuing our work on looking at racial disparities in the justice system here in Vermont. And we started this morning with the Chief Justice uh, of the Vermont Supreme Court in his role as the chair of the Justice Reinvestment II Working Group uh, to discuss the, um, the, uh, the work that the group has done uh, specifically on racial disparities in Vermont, uh, something that the uh, that council state governments um, brought to our attention. It's something that many of us knew about. Um, it's uncomfortable to talk about, but it's incredibly important. And I'm very grateful for the chief justice and his leadership and the council of state government in um, their, um, their research and their data collection in um, showing us the data, the Vermont data, and um, giving us recommendations uh, to, um, to mitigate and begin to eliminate uh, those racial disparities in Vermont. And, um, and in their presentation, the Council of State Governments did reference RDAP and uh, RDAP's work um, on racial disparities and the need for a Bureau of Racial Statistics or some entity that will do that data collecting. And, that, um, and what an important piece that is um, for this continuing work. And so, um, so to that end, I have um, invited Aten Nasraddin Longo um, to discuss with us uh, the RDAP report. And I, I know that you wear a few different hats, so um, I welcome you to, uh, to introduce your, your, yourself and, and uh, tell us um, about the incredible work that you've been doing and helping us um, to, uh, to get this right. And, okay. uh, so, so welcome and, um, and thank, you. thank you. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Great, great. Thank you for the introduction. I am, um, it is an uncomfortable thing, isn't it? Um, I'm very aware that today is January 6th. Um, it's really hard not to be aware that today is January 6th. It's been very hard, I know, just personally, having many people, um, sadly a lot of Caucasians, talk to me about how white supremacy really wasn't a foundational thought that was going on a year ago today at the Capitol. Um, I remember watching the events unfold on television and seeing flags of various organizations that made it quite clear to me that there was a lot of connection with the idea of white supremacy. Um, we were, as the RDAP, very aware of that notion, certainly when we began with our report that was due, we've had a report due 2019, 2020, and 2021. And in the 2019 report, um, in the preamble, we quoted the um, legal scholar and critical race theorist, Francis Ansley, um, about, white, uh, about white supremacy, in fact, as we named it in that report. And I'd like to just start by reading that. She says, by white supremacy, I do not mean to allude only to the self-conscious racism of white supremacist hate groups. I refer instead to a political, economic, and cultural system in which whites overwhelmingly control power and material resources. Conscious and unconscious ideas of white superiority and entitlement are widespread, and relations of white dominance and non-white subordination are daily reenacted across a broad array of institutions and social settings. We summed up after that for the preamble, in short, we speak of a social order in place for many centuries, which causes damage not only to people of color, but also to various Caucasians who at the same time benefit in many ways from the privilege that it confers. It is a system that we have all been part of either consciously or unconsciously. It lives in all people and institutions, regardless of individual desire, belief or comprehension. And the way that we went about starting to attack that issue 
um, was very much rooted in questions that Act 54 of 2017 raised. There were several. Um, one, it guided the IRDAP to think about how a public complaint process would be put together to address perceived implicit bias across all systems of state government. Um, we were also asked to talk about racial profiling, whether and how to prohibit it. Um, and lastly in this, we were asked um, about data collection and about data collection practices. And we came up with a very great list, I thought. Um, the feedback that we got from joint judicial oversight was that it was a wonderful view from 50,000 feet, but that they really would like something that would be even more detailed than this. Um, what we did come up with, and just the, the broadest parts, were uh, firstly to increase data collection with respect both to court processes and administrative processes. Vermont should collect data that captures the high impact high discretion decision points that occur during several moments. One, judicial processes within state's attorney's office, office of the attorney general, office of the defender general and the judiciary, and then other places, Department of Children and Families, corrections, and so on. Um, we also moved that the, and recommended that there be an expansion and improvement of data collection with respect to law enforcement. And finally, we urged a commitment to staffing and other resources to collect and compile data properly. That to me is the significant point here um, because that point on its own led to the report that came the following year. Um, that report was focused more on detail. Um, I remember a group of us, that was, um, that report was specifically about section 19 of act 148 of that year. Um, and what we did <laughs> broadly was to find a lot of data, data that had been siloed, pull it out, look at the high impact, high discretion moments and with help of various partners, in, in the state with whom we work, notably Crime Research Group, um, we were able to pull out what data do exist, what data do not exist, and what would have to be kind of finagled in a sense, because the systems that are used to codify in, say, corrections are not immediately compatible with systems that are used in public safety. Um, they did, everyone did yeoman's work on this. We were very grateful certainly also to um, Crime Research Group for what they were able to give us. Um, that report consisted largely of prioritized moments, high impact, high discretion moments within the criminal and juvenile justice systems on which data, at which data should be collected. Um, and those were, there are tables. Um, I didn't hand that in to Amber Burke. I figured enough reports, I gave her one. I thought I didn't wanna like give her everything we'd done over the last three years. I figured that would, you know, could come later if you wanted to look at it certainly. And of course you all have it um, on the website. Um, so those, uh, we broke those moments down and ended up having to prioritize them because there were a lot of moments, there were a lot of moments. <laughs> there were a lot of moments. Um, and it really became a moment uh, for us, a, mo a moment of making decisions about what is most important and what is perhaps front loaded would be a better term than most important. Um, and we did that, that was really difficult work. Um, it was, it was intensely difficult work because so many things, you know, you don't want to shelve things, it, it, how to put it, just take the sentence, we're going to shelve a moment of discrimination. That's not something you ever want to say. That's just not something you ever want to say. And it's certainly not something you want to hear 
So it was rather difficult to come up with this, but we did it anyway. Um, and really sort of um, emphasized that these other moments needed to be kept in mind as things progressed. Um, we were able, again, with the help of the um, Council of State Government, to make connections with um, the state of Connecticut's criminal justice policy and planning division in the Office of Policy and Management, because they have a group of people who do this sort of work, not just limited to the criminal and juvenile justice systems, but that that was certainly one of their big um, mandates was to look at uh, disparities in those, in those areas. Um, we brought that to the attention of the legislature. And then based on several meetings with them, we were able to make further recommendations. Um, and it again, one of the first, and this is Act 148 of um, what, two years ago, I'm losing track of time. Um, the first was that a body charged with a definition, collection, and analysis of data pertaining to racial disparities across the juvenile and adult criminal justice systems be both be created and staffed. Experience has shown that Connecticut has needed three staff members charged with data collection and analysis. Um, in a strange sense, that was the paragraph that led to the report that we're now discussing, um, which is um, about Act 65 of last year. Um, you will note that all of these reports are sort of the RDAP with parachute. We started at 50,000 feet and we're getting closer and closer to earth. Um, this one, this is on earth, if I may, if I may go so far. I do not know how much more detailed it would be possible for this group of people as it is presently constituted with its partners, um, including Crime Research Group to go. Um, I mean, there's a lot more around data collection. Crime Research Group is thinking about that along with several members of the RDAP. Um, but in terms of making overall recommendations and presentations to the legislature, I think we're on the ground now to carry the metaphor to the logical conclusion, maybe a little bit below ground. Um, this report is exhaustive in my, um, in my belief system, at least. Um, we were asked by that act to um, really look into a bureau at that point, it was called the bureau. Um, for a variety of reasons, we changed it to office um, and, but the, the act has, a uh, bureau asks us to, um, speak about the creation of this bureau, uh, which would collect and analyze data related to systemic racial bias and disparities within the criminal and juvenile justice systems. The report shall address, and there are five things. One, where the bureau should be situated, taking into account the necessity for independence and the advantages and disadvantages of being a standalone body or being housed in state government. Two, how and to what extent the Bureau should be staffed. Three, what should be the scope of the Bureau's mission. Four, how the Bureau should conduct data collection and analysis. And five, the best methods for the Bureau to enforce its data collection and analysis responsibilities. We consulted with a lot of people that we were asked to speak with, Crime Research Group, um, the National Center on Restorative Justice, um, UVM, and any other entity that would be of assistance um, to the Bureau and certainly to the RDAP. Um, we were asked to consult and have the assistance, assistance of the Chief Performance Officer and the Chief Data Officer. Um, the, we really reviewed this report as a continuation of the work that had begun two years before. Um, we spent the summer writing it. 
Um, we met every Monday night. Um, we, <laughs> we had homework, um, as you can imagine. We relied very heavily upon principles set out in the actionable Intelligence for Social Policy, AISP, Racial Equity Toolkit. Um, a quote from there, this body of work seeks to encourage shifts of awareness and practice by centering racial equity and community voice within the context of data integration and use. Our vision is one of ethical data use with a racial equity lens that supports power sharing and building across agencies and community members. And so what we came up with was an exhaustive, I keep using that word, but I don't know what else to use, um, report that described the structure of this bureau, how it should be governed, how power and information should flow. Um, we are very blessed to have some people who are data uh, experts on the RDAP itself. They, um, they contributed that would, I mean, they contributed enormously to the section of the report that I will admit with a bit of a smile, I don't understand. Um, where they go into extraordinary detail about how the data need to be thought of, what kind of agreements need to be um, gathered in order for the data to be gathered itself, um, how the staffing of the Bureau interacts with the, the kind of data that are being extracted and so on and so forth. Um, and this document really dovetailed quite extraordinarily with what the Council of State Governments had come up with. Because as you know from this morning, they came back at us and said, one of our most cherished beliefs of Vermont exceptionalism that we treat everybody differently here than happens in the entire rest of the United States is not true, <laughs> which I don't think was a surprise for a lot of us with certain kinds of tinting, but it was certainly a surprise for certain Vermonters. Um, that's fine. That's why we do data. That's why we do data. So we can answer these questions and figure out what are our biases about ourselves, as well as biases about others. And that's what they were hoping for. And that's what we, in a certain sense, separate from what they were doing, came up with when we put this report together. And I think that's really, I would just take questions at this point. I'm tried to give you another 50,000 foot view of our movements over the last three years, culminating with the report that you now have in front of you. Um, and if there are any questions or comments, I'm, you know, I'm certainly open to answering what I can. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm gonna ask you, if you could just um, remind us because there, there are also people um, from, we don't know where, but have um, have access by YouTube to watch this. Um, can you remind us who is on RDAP and what does RDAP stand for? Okay, RDAP is not actually the acronym. That <laughs> I know. RDAP stands for Racial Disparities Advisory Panel. The its proper name is the Advisory Panel on Racial Disparities in the Criminal and Juvenile Job. No. Yes, the advisory panel on <laughs> racial disparities in the juvenile and uh, the criminal and juvenile justice systems. It is under the aegis of the attorney general. Um, it is an interesting body in that it involves community members as well as governmental actors who all come together with radically different viewpoints and sit down at the table and work through disagreements, different viewpoints, so on and so forth. Um, we were brought into being in 2017 by Act 54, which also asked for that first report. Um, we are to produce a report every two years. Uh, we're ahead of schedule, I'm proud to say. Um, that we, 
you know, to talk about where things have gone, how much has gotten done. Um, this data issue has, for a variety of reasons, risen to the fore, uh, to the top. And so we have been concentrating very heavily on that for the past couple of years. Who's on it? Oh my God, list, which I cannot, I will have to pull that up. Uh, that's, a, that's okay. What? I think um, I, what I wanted, to, um, and, I, and I think you did touch on it, a very diverse group of stakeholders. Oh my God, yes. Yeah, yes, and I think that's, that's, so. that's important. Um, that really did come together. Um, with a lot of agreement after a lot of discussion. And uh, yeah. so, so great. And we can look it up, but <laughs> I just want yeah, to- No, there, there, yeah. I, I, I'm gonna start talking and I'm gonna leave somebody out, you know, and that's gonna go badly. <laughs> no, I appreciate that. And, and it is on our um, committee um, committee page. Uh, so we'll yeah. we'll make sure that, um, that those who would like to see it um, has access to it. So, great. You know what, I can do it. I can do it. I've got it. Which he are these are the community representatives. Which he are two, data warehouse specialist and social justice consultant. Jessica Brown, visiting assistant professor of criminal law at the law school. Jeff Jones, former Vermont State Police Trooper. Sheila Linton, co-founder and executive director of the Root Social Justice Center in Brattleboro. Myself and Chief Don Stegen Stevens of the Nulhegan Band of the Kusuk of the Abnaki Nation. Those are the community representatives. Um, the state government representatives, we have Tyler Allen, who is representing Department of Children and Families. Uh, Susanna Davis, who is the Executive Director of Racial Equity for the state. Jennifer Furpo, Law Enforcement Certification and Training Coordinator at the Criminal Justice Council. Uh, Judge Grierson was on it. He has retired, which annoys me enormously, although I am now getting to meet Judge Zone, um, who will be taking his place. Evan Meenan um, from the Deputy State's Attorney, he's a Deputy State's Attorney from the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. Um, Captain Barb Kessler from the Vermont State Police, who represents um, Commissioner Shirley. Um, uh, was Julio Thompson from the Attorney General's office? I believe it's now Aaron. Oh, Aaron, what is your last name? This is so embarrassing. Abramson? I've gotten it wrong. Oh, I'm embarrassed. Anyway, I will get her flowers. Uh, Rebecca Turner. Appellate Defender, Office of the Defender General, and Monica Weber, who is the Administrative Services Director for DOC. Thank you, thank you. That, that's very helpful because it shows that there's really quite um, a number of people. And I know you have um, subcommittees and so very diverse um, and comprehensive group doing very important work. So thank you, thank you so much. Can Absolutely. Yeah, committee members, any? Questions, comments. Um, again, this is we'll we'll come back to this. But I just uh, uh, sorry. Um, okay, so Bob and then Selena. Thank you, <clears throat> Dr. Longo, Eton. I don't know what you prefer, but uh, thank you. Eton is perfectly fine. That's what my mother uses. <laughs> well, I'm certainly not your mother, but no. <laughs> Uh, a couple of quick questions, Eton. <clears throat> One is the Connecticut model is based on three or if this office of statistics gathering comes to fruition. The, the Connecticut model is with three individuals running this, correct? Correct. And secondly, uh, from one of my fellow uh, representatives, much more knowledgeable than I am at this, obviously on this committee, there are uh, several entities that gather these statistics already. What do we hope to gain from setting up an individual office at a much additional expenses, I might add? Yes, good question. None of these systems talk to each other. None of them. They do not speak to each other. One of the things that we have grown to understand, or I should say I've grown to understand perhaps, along with several other members of the panel, since 2017, 
is that it's not a simple matter of this talks to this talks to this. It doesn't work that way. It should. It feels logical. It feels self-subsistent. It feels very understandable. It doesn't work. So that as long as you may want the information to be cross-correlated, but it doesn't, it needs help. And that takes experts in data management. So having said that, and I'll finish with this question, obviously. So is it a matter of us simply coordinating these individual efforts so that they do talk to one another rather than create another office for whatever reason and costing taxpayers more money in the same process? If we could put those I would say not. I would say not because I think it's more than the coordination. You have to have a certain stance on social justice to know what data are in fact important. And that's not always obvious to people. Okay, thank you. There'll be several other questions I'm sure as we go along, but I appreciate you being Absolutely. here. Absolutely. Uh, Selena. Uh, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to have you with us and um, really appreciate the, I know, um, the legislature just continues to ask more and more of um, this yeah. group. And so just appreciate all the all the labor that you and others have put into um, these reports and beyond. And I, I just wanna make sure I understand the chronology of all the reports that you were talking about. Um, so is the most re recent report from RDAP is the one on the data that we, just sort of looked at with you back in 2021, or had, have you authored any additional recommendations or analysis since then? I just want to make sure we, I'm not missing anything. We put a report together that we submitted on November 15th that okay. outlines the structuring of this proposed Office of Racial Justice Statistics. Okay, thank you for clarifying that for me. I think sure. I lost Absolutely. you a little bit in, no, the, I, in that chronology. I, so I get really it. I get that. I keep looking at them and realizing we use the same font for all of them, so they all look the same. <laughs> Maybe we need to change that. Okay, good. Thank you, uh, Martin. I'm going to try to put my hand down and do all these things. <clears throat> not not working really quickly on those yet. Uh, we'll get better over the next week. Um, I, I guess it's more a couple of comments. I just a little more context, uh, and perhaps also uh, for for Bob, that um, going into my eighth year right now, in the past eight years, and I'm sure that uh, uh, Maxine and and uh, Barbara and Tom can probably all share this uh, frustration. Uh, that we've had, that we've been trying to address various issues in the criminal justice system and really kind of flying blind uh, or, just, or just basing it on anecdotes uh, rather than good data. And, and there have been times when we re really have sought data and it's been really hard to come by, uh, even with uh, research, uh, with the crime research group. I think also, you know, what we saw that uh, the uh, CSG could do with their dive into data. Uh, and they only really looked at, you know, there's a lot of stuff missing from what they were trying to look at or would like to look at, but they were able to actually show some things in our criminal justice system that, uh, you know, we weren't really aware of. And, and I think it's trying to uncover those, uh, those uh, inequities in the system that, that the data will help. And, and I think, Bob, you can really see the scope of the data uh, that, that uh, we're talking about as being uh, very important uh, in the bill that was introduced last year, H317. Uh, that lays out all the various data points uh, that are important, they're high impact data points uh, and a lot of them, we don't have the data yet, uh, and the data is not being collected. And part of this office is to actually work with these different agencies, uh, the state's attorneys, the Department of Corrections, the courts, law enforcement, et cetera, 
uh, to gather that data and aggregate it and make it useful for our decision making and for the administration's decision making. So, so it's been years that we tried to do this and 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 it just <clears throat> So I think is a little bit perspective uh, that I just wanted to offer there. Yeah, and, and as to and, and thank you, Martin. I, I appreciate that. And as to that, I don't oppose the data gathering. That's not what I oppose. I, I oppose duplication of efforts sure. having the same and costing taxpayers more money in the process. Data gathering is good. I agree with that, but let's make sure we do it the right way. Absolutely, absolutely agree. Yeah, and Bob, those would be. Great questions that I hope you um, ask again when we when we dive in, into the into the bill and and look at it and uh, and follow up on it as one of um, the council state government's recommendations um, to us that we heard this morning. Okay. Okay. Well, great. Well, thank you, thank you, Aton. Thank you so much. My and pleasure. Uh, thank you all for your time. You bet. And we will uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Absolutely. Bye bye. Bye. So, committee, we are going to um, take care. We are going to transition to um, expungement. Um, how about if we take about a five minute stretch break? Um, I need to find my printed out hard copy <laughs> for my printer. And um, but the bill, hi, Michelle, welcome. The, um, the bill should be on online for all of us, um, as well as the justice oversights uh, report from. Uh, Justice Oversight, which Michelle is going to go through. So um, let's really, you know, three, five minutes stretch, come back and uh, and have Michelle do a walkthrough. Thank you. And we'll have Michelle start with the, um, the Just, Justice Oversight report. So good afternoon, Michelle. Good to see you. Hi, nice to see you guys. Welcome back. Thank you. You let me know when you're ready to go. Ready. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, y'all probably remember that last year when you worked a lot on ceiling and um, you did wind up passing S7, um, but it was uh, pretty heavily kind of scaled back from, from where you had been doing a lot of the substantive work. Um, and I'm obviously taking this over from Bryn since Bryn had been working on it for several years. So you probably have a lot more of the background and the reasons for some of the poly policy decisions actually more than, than I do. Um, but what happened was last year in S7, you directed the uh, Justice Oversight Committee to take a look at it. And so they did. And so I'm gonna share the screen um, and... Can everybody see the memo? Yes. Yeah. I don't yes. know. Maxine, yeah, can you yeah, yeah, we can. And, okay. Um, All right. Sorry. Yeah. I'm never quite sure with the sharing. Michelle, Michelle, can yeah. you blow it up just a touch? Uh, let's see. Beautiful. Thank awesome. you. All right, wow, I learned another little tab on my Zoom screen. Thank you there, Tom. <laughs> um, so, uh, so the committee did take it up um, and uh, you probably know for justice oversight, it's comprised of uh, legislators from a variety of committees. So you have folks from judiciary, you have folks from institutions, from human services and healthcare, folks from the money committee. So it's a really varied group because there's such a broad jurisdiction that that, the, that committee covers. And so I think it was, you know, if you think back on the work that you guys have done on the ceiling and expungement issue for the last several years, you know, it's complex. And, um, you know, if you, you know, even if you're the committee of jurisdiction that does it day in and, and, and day out for, for the last few years. Um, and so it was a little bit, I think, I don't think I'm stepping out of bounds or say it was a little un, of an unwieldy topic for folks who hadn't really dealt with it before. Um, and so they, the, the directive, which I'll go through here, if you look at the memo um, and you'll see the legislation in S7, which was Act 58, um, that designated the task for justice oversight. You'll see that the committee was to propose legislation for this year, 
um, on certain recommendations. The first one being a policy to make all or most criminal history records eligible for sealing or expungement, um, with the exception of what we refer to as like the big 12 that are in Title uh, 33. Um, the second one was that the individuals or entities that should have access to those sealed or ex uh, those sealed records if you go with sealing instead of expungement. Um, whether or not Vermont should continue to use a two track system where we have both sealing and expungement or whether or not Vermont should move to a one track system that picks either sealing or expungement for eligible offenses. And then the last one is how to implement an automated process for automatic sealing so that it would not be up to the person who has the record to be doing the petitioning the court to obtain um, the sealing or the expungement. Um, you'll see that they did take up the issue at several meetings um, and discuss that. They heard from all the usual cast of characters who are interested in this topic and who have come before you at previous hearings. Um, but they weren't able to come up with a solid proposal, um, I think, because of just the complexities of it. And they thought that a lot of the issues were more appropriate for the committees of jurisdiction. But they did um, address some of the issues, the first one being um, that they decided that it would be preferable to go with a one track ceiling system um, over the system that you currently have. Um, and I'll, I'll put in the caveat there that that's predicated on the idea that you would have a different definition of sealing than, than what you have currently. Because right now in the law for sealing, as you know, so if for what we have for expungement is essentially the, the record is destroyed and no one has access to that record if the record is expunged. But for a sealed record, um, there is access. And most notably, I think the one that people were concerned about was just general law enforcement access to all of those sealed records for what is termed as law enforcement purposes. So it's pretty it's pretty broad there. And I think that was what people identified as their, their biggest concern around what does sealing mean and how, if we're going to use a one-track system, how would we redefine that? Um, so you see just the memo talks a little bit about um, how uh, the Oversight Committee views the existing system as overly complex and unnecessarily complex and that moving to a one track system of sealing would be easier for everyone, especially people who are looking to have those records sealed. Um, so uh, the next issue is, is to look at the offenses that would be eligible under a sealing proposal. Um, and again, a lot of this, I think, will, will look fairly familiar to you because it was primarily taken from the last kind of substantive version of when your committee was really digging down into the details of, of which offenses should be eligible. The version that had come over from the Senate to you was more expansive, but my understanding was that the administration had concerns that they expressed to you that they would not be supportive of the Senate version. And so you were trying to work with stakeholders and the administration on trying to um, whittle that list down. And so this more closely mirrors that. Um, so you see with respect to eligible offenses, uh, the first is to include all misdemeanors with the exception of the following here. So you'll see the list there. Um, the first one is listed crimes. So you know that that's that list in, in 5301, um, pretty, pretty long list of, of offenses. Um, the second one is that uh, crimes that would not be eligible would be under chapter 64, which I know you guys are familiar with that chapter because you just worked a lot with it last year and that's regarding sexual exploitation of children. Um, next would be any, uh, any crimes related to violation of uh, protection orders. Um, next is uh, voyeurism, cruelty to animals, uh, violation of aggravated disorderly conduct, neglect to do, of duty by a public officer, uh, failure to comply with sex offender registry requirements, obscenity, hate motivated crimes and uh, burning of a religious symbol. So again, those uh, those crimes I think were taken from your last kind of substantive list uh, in S7. Um, 
<laughs> There's a bunch of questions here. I, think. I see that. Yep. I think my hand went up first, but I always defer to Tom. No, Judy, go ahead. No, you're, your page. You're, um, you're fine. Thank you. Um, so what, what, what was the basis for, for these exclusions? I mean, is it because the administration didn't want these? Uh, was there information or data about recidivism rates? Are these, these uh, just considered particularly egregious crimes? Was there, what was before uh, the Justice Oversight Committee to, to make these recommendations? I'm curious. They did not go into the reasons for this. They just picked up the last work of your committee and chose to move forward with that. They did not hear from um, the administration on the, the particulars. There were similar questions, you know, in justice oversight, uh, I think particularly like, well, why is neglect of duty by a public officer there or certain ones? And I, I honestly, I, I don't know, um, uh, but this, so I, I don't, I, and because I hadn't worked on it last year, um, I'm not sure why this list looks the way that it does, but this was kind of where it left off in House Judiciary last spring. So, so presumably we can ask witnesses on this, on what they think of each of these, whether they should be included or not and what the basis is. Okay, thanks. Correct, yep. Tom, I'm see everybody, but go ahead, Tom. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Go no, go ahead, Maxine. No, I, I just I was just calling on you, but I'm, but I'm saying that if I don't see um if I don't see people whose hands are up, just jump in. So go ahead, Tom. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, number ten, uh, Michelle, violation related to obscenity. Uh, what is that? <laughs> it seems like it could be pretty broad. That's a great question, Tom. I have to say, I don't really work. I haven't worked much in the obscenity chapter, um, but we can, let's see if we can, I don't know if I can switch my, let me see if I can switch my screen real quick and um, we can take a quick look. So this is an education for you also, huh? It is. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, um, so disseminating, can you see the screen? Uh, it's the same screen that it was, but that's all right. Uh, Go ahead. Hold on. Let me see. Um, oh, I think I have to take the other one down. Oh, well, well, I'll just tell you it's yeah. uh, disseminating indecent material to a minor in the presence of a minor, disseminating indecent material to a minor outside the presence of a minor. So generally dis distribution of indecent material. And I can send you that link. If there's no, any- No, no, that's fine. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm good with that. We're look, sounds like most of it's uh, geared around uh, minors. So that's, that's a good thing. Thank you. Right, sure. Um, all right, now I'm gonna have to remember how to get back. So you can still you can still see the memo, right? Yeah, the original screen is still okay, there. Okay, sorry about that. It's this is my first Zoom with sharing since we've been back, so I've forgotten a little bit of my tricks. Um, so yeah, so I think generally, you know, most of the discussion has been on the um, on misdemeanors that relate to violence or um, sexual crimes, things like that. So you know, I think probably most folks' questions have related to these things that don't involve that. And I think you'll probably just need to hear from the witnesses and specifically from the administration um, as to why they were looking to have these, um, these crimes uh, ineligible for sealing or expungement. Um, so the next is, so, so generally the rule would be all misdemeanors except this list, okay? And then the opposite is the truth is is true for felonies. So the, um, the Senate included all felonies but had a, a list of exempted felonies that wouldn't qualify. But again, because of op my understanding opposition from the administration, the House looked at doing what you have here, which is most felonies would not be eligible. However, these would. So the first being um, that uh, 
that burglary and uh, that burglary would be a qualifying offense, excluding any burglary into an occupied dwelling unless the person was 25 years of age or younger at the time the offense was committed and the person did not carry a weapon. Then designated property, felony property offenses, which you can look, you can see they're footnoted here. So you can see those are also in the draft that I'm gonna go over with you. So there's certain felony property offenses that would be eligible. The third category are offenses relating to selling, dispensing, or transporting regulated drugs. And so, but that does not include trafficking. So anything that would, that would be selling or dispensing but short of trafficking would be eligible. And again, when I'm talking about eligible, doesn't mean that it's automatic. You would have to apply and then meet the conditions. And then the fourth one being any offense for which a person has been granted an unconditional pardon from the governor. So again, just kind of to try to get your head around it, it's that all misdemeanors except for a list and then no felonies except for a list. <laughs> so it's kind of the opposite. So I know there's a lot, a lot of offenses moving around there. And then especially once we get to the draft, it'll really make your head spin, but that's the general rule. <laughs> Any any other questions about that? Okay, and so I just wanted to note there that the Justice Oversight Committee, while they weren't in now recommending that most felonies be eligible for sealing, they did believe that that's the direction that the General Assembly should be going and that the list should be expanded over time to include most nonviolent felonies providing um, that the court finds that the ceiling is in the interest of justice and prosecutors continue to be notified of the petitions and have an opportunity to weigh in on the petition before the court makes a determination. Um, the next issue is the definition of ceiling. Um, they weren't, again, I think able to in the time allotted to really dig into who should have access to what and for how long and under what circumstances. Um, but the committee did feel that a new definition of ceiling should be developed and that the general rule should be to be protecting that information and only allowing very limited access to those sealed records for a certain period of time. Um, and so that's, uh, and then what the, the draft that you have does do that. Um, the committee supported designating some offenses as eligible for automatic sealing, uh, meaning that they wouldn't, the defendant wouldn't have to file for a petition, um, but would, it would just happen automatically on some kind of tickler system. Um, however, considering the time and expense required for that undertaking, um, and it's really unclear now, plus coupled with the um, fact that the court is having a hard time um, just because of COVID and money and resources and all of those things being able to comply with um, what's set out already with regard to expungements and sealing um, that to kind of just add more on to that right now until there's a little bit of catch up time and there's a clear proposal coming from the uh, stakeholders that would be tasked with doing the sealing that um, right now there was they were not recommending any movement towards an automatic sealing or adding any new offenses for an automatic sealing. Um, but they are supportive of the idea. And that's it for the memo. So okay to move on to the draft for everybody. Um, all right, now I got to remember how to take it down. Can you, can somebody remind me, Amber, can you remind me how to move it? Oh, stop share. And then I have to reshare again, I think. Let's see. So, and um, while Michelle is, is getting us set up, I just want to reiterate what I uh, stated yesterday is uh, that today is, is a walkthrough of the bill. Uh, the stakeholders, uh, folks that we heard from uh, last year and also that um, watched um, the work of Justice Oversight, um, were all sent a copy of the, um, of the bill, as well as the uh, YouTube link in case they wanted to watch today's um, walkthrough. And then um, I hope to have testimony 
next week. And, um, and like pretty much any draft that's introduced, um, it's a starting point, starting point of, of the conversation. And um, Michelle did a lot of work on this to, uh, to come up to speed. It's, it's, it's very complicated, as you know, I've been saying for years, it's, it's very complicated. And then we keep adding on to it and adding on to it. Um, so I, I really, Michelle, I really, really appreciate your work on this. Sure. Thank you. Okay, can everybody see the draft up? Yes, okay. Um, so I will say that because this issue is new to me this year and looking at it, um, I just wanted to just scrap the whole thing and start all over again, honestly, and rewrite it. But I realized that folks, so there's a lot of folks who have been working with this particular chapter and such, and I, I, I thought it might be harder for folks to be able to follow along and be able to come to look at the changes, the policy changes, if I got rid of it all and just repealed it and started out with something new. But I would say for you to think about as we work with this chapter, um, what you think about that idea, because I, I think that maybe once we kind of get a handle on, on where the committee wants to go, I do think that it would be best to, to repeal, if not the chapter, so at least some of these sections and for me to write it fresh for something that's going to move forward. You don't have to do it now at this point and we can work within it, but it's really um, because I think it, it ha it's a chapter that has been amended so often over the last several years um, and in, in, in a real piecemeal way. Um, I, I do feel as though it's kind of structured. Um, it's more complicated, I think, than it needs to be. And I think, you, I think if we rewrote it from, if, from scratch, I could make it a lot more user friendly for everybody because um, you know, I mean, you guys know I've been doing criminal law with you guys for, uh, you know, more than a couple of decades, and it was hard to understand what was going on in here <laughs> for me and took a while. And, and we don't want that. We want anybody, obviously. It's, you know, our goal when we're drafting these statutes is for anybody, whether you're a lawyer or not, to be able to open up the green books and to be able to have a general sense of what it's, what it's saying. And, um, and so I just put that out to you to say, you know, as we kind of slog through this, think about whether or not you think it might be better to just um, get rid of get rid of it and start from scratch. Um, so we're going to start out with Section 7601 in the definition section. Um, the big change here being if you look on line 19 on page two being the definition of qualifying crime and that's um, what we just kind of went through. Um, you right now it, it has it listed as a misdemeanor offense that is not so that's kind of similar to what you have but it's a, a, a bigger misdemeanor list so you have there that we talked about it's going to be all misdemeanors except the ones we just went over in the memo. Um, and then the second thing is it's going to be instead of all felonies it's just going to be a handful of felonies and so it's going to be those burglary into an occupied dwelling. Um, uh, for a, a, a small slice of that, it's going to be designated property, felony property offenses. It's going to be uh, selling or dispensing drugs, and it's going to be uh, offenses for which there was an unconditional pardon. Subdivision five there on page six is your list of the designated felony property offenses. Page eight is uh, you have the definition of subsequent offense means the conviction of a crime committed by the person who's the subject of the petition to seal a criminal history record if it arose out of a new incident or occurrence after the person was convicted of the crime to be sealed. And so that's where sometimes when you have so making sure that we're not talking about the same incident or same offense and multiple charges that came out of that. So section two on page eight, so here's the process. Starting in subsection one, here's what uh, the general process is for the petition. So a person may file a petition requesting sealing. And again, right now, if you'll re recall, what you have is this two track where 
People can seal under certain circumstances and expunge under certain circumstances, and it depends on the type of crime and the length of time that's gone by. Excuse me, I see Bob's hand is up. Yep. Now, Michelle, a quick question on number six, subsequent offense. Sure. Under the old writing, uh, there was a time period but this simply states uh, the conviction of a crime committed by with no time period. Is it less than five years, more than five years? What's the difference? I think you have to look at it when we go through and we look at the, um, the criteria for each grouping of crimes, you'll see um, there will be time periods within each of those. And so it doesn't so much apply any longer to when, how long, there was a separation for that sub for that subsequent offense, but there is still a time period for how long it's been since. It's kind of built in in a different way substantively. So when we get to that, I'll kind of point that out to you if that makes sense. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, so for so under A1, these are the folks who can apply, who can petition the court for sealing of the record. Um, uh, A1A being the person was convicted of a qualifying crime, and that's that list we just went through. Um, they uh, they can apply if the conviction was for an offense that is no longer prohibited by law or designated as a criminal offense. The one that um, we think about often is for uh, possession of, of an ounce or less of cannabis, which is uh, was criminal uh, misdemeanor and is no longer. Um, subdivision A1C relates to the, uh, relates to DUI. Top of page nine, subdivision A1D um, has to do with burglary. So subdivision A2 on page nine, this is the process. So the state's attorney or the attorney general is the respondent in the matter. So they are always notified and are, um, are included in the process. So for the, you'll see new language for those offenses eligible for an early petition with stipulation. Um, this just has to do with who can, who can answer. Um, so if a person petitions to seal a criminal history record prior to the date of the offense that is eligible for sealing, um, only the office that prosecuted the offense that is the subject of the sealing petition can um, stipulate to that petition. Stipulate just again is just saying we agree with this where there's an agreement between the uh, petitioner and the respondent to, um, to do the sealing. Um, however, the office that prosecuted the offense can waive that requirement if they so choose to do that. So subdivision three, court is to grant the petition without a hearing if the petitioner and the respondent stipulate to the granting of the petition. Subdivision four is just an exemption um, for, uh, for CDL drivers. Um, with regard to the uh, Title 23 DUI provisions. Subdivision five, top of page 10, is except for criminal conviction records of offenses for which the underlying conduct is no longer prohibited. A criminal conviction record of a person who's under the supervision of DOC at the time the person files a petition shall not be eligible for sealing. So you'll see when we go down to the individual kind of uh, criteria for all these different offenses, um, the, basically the first criteria in all of those is that the person has satisfied the judgment, which means that they've served any sentence um, that was ordered as part of that conviction. You have to have completed that. So you can't be under DOC supervision as part of the uh, sentencing for that conviction and be eligible. So subsection B is where we start in the different categories. Can I back up and ask a question about that, Michelle? Yep. Um, so, sorry, I'm having, I'm reading it from my, <laughs> my own screen because it's a little hard to read from this year screen with my aging eyesight. Um, I mean, is this just anyone who's under supervision of DOC period or is it just like if you're still under supervision for that particular crime, 
or like could it be like i i'm under supervision for a crime that i recently committed but i that means i'm not eligible to have any past convictions expunged under this i think what we want to do is we want to look at each category and each category has certain criteria and for and my recollection is it's for some of them you have to have basically if you have a subsequent offense you have to have completed the term and the conditions of that subsequent offense and i think maybe for others not necessarily Does that answer your question? And as we go through, I it can- It does, I guess as I'm reading you, it just seems like anybody who's under DOC supervision at all, whether it's, but I'll, let's keep going. It's I'll, a good question. Let's go through it and then we'll circle back. Cause I'm not, I may not, I may not know the answer to that without going through it myself. <laughs> okay. I mean, I think I know based on testimony we heard last year, kind of where coming from, it was a concern raised by, DOC, but I, anyway, right. I want to understand right. a little better the implications of this. Thank you. Right. Um, I think generally it is if you, but, but we'll take a look, but I think generally it is, is if you, if you are under supervision for a subsequent offense that you're supposed to have completed that as well, but let's see. <laughs> um, so subsection B, qualifying non-predicate misdemeanors and possession of regulated drug misdemeanors. So this is, so remember our two categories are all misdemeanors except certain ones and then only a handful of felonies. And then what the next few subsections do is create subcategories within the misdemeanors and the felonies. So this one is non-predicate. So meaning they don't build or get hot, get more uh, like, you know, where you have a first offense, second offense for the, for the certain type of crime where you have an increased penalty. So that, those would be those. So there's non-predicate misdemeanors and then possession of regulated drugs. So under those circumstances, um, the court is to grant the petition um, if the following conditions are met. Um, the first one being at least three years have elapsed since uh, the date on which the person su uh, successfully satisfied the judgment. Um, um, or if they had an indeterminate term of probation um, at least three years previously. So we, we don't have that indeterminate probation any longer, but we used to, and so I think that's intended to be just to kind of catch some of those older cases. This is probably more a question for Maxine. Should I flag, because we might be rewriting this, a provision that's particularly confusing, which is uh, just the way it's written, this uh, number one, the at least three years bit, or should I not worry about that at this point? No, um, go ahead. And yeah, it's just it's just I, the way that that reads that I just don't think that we should have the subsection A or B. It should just be all one paragraph and then it makes sense. I had to read it three times to kind of understand what the whichever is later really was applying to, for instance, uh, and and just the a little awkward starting subsection B with the if the person committed a subsequent offense, not so awkward if it comes directly after the or with a comma there, for instance. But you know, that's if we stay with this, I would really suggest that that was particularly confusing. And, and I think it's repeated one other place with similar language. I'll just flag that for you. Sure, I'm, I'm with you, Martin. Um, uh, I, again, I was trying to use uh, the last draft and work off of that um, because people were familiar with that. And that was something, um, that y'all had put a lot of work into, but I think uh, a, a rewriting of this would look um, pretty pretty different um, because there are a couple of places actually where it's redundant and it doesn't need to be separated out into different sections, but I just kind of went with what was there and the format for how it had been laid out, but it doesn't need to be organized in that format any longer. Um, 
So you'll see the top of page 11, subdivision B, if the person committed a subsequent offense, the date on which the person satisfied the judgment for the subsequent offense, whichever is later. So under that circumstance, um, it seems as though going back to Selena, Selena's question is, um, so for those types of misdemeanors, they it sounds as though they would not need to have to have completed it. So well, they did satisfy the judgment. No, you're right. So it would have to be. They would have to have completed any term of probation and not be under DOC supervision for that. Um, subdivision two is any restitution uh, that was ordered or surcharges has been paid in full. And then the third is that the court finds that sealing the record serves the interest of justice. And so those three conditions, one, that the person satisfied the judgment and has served any term of incarceration or community supervision has been completed, um, any restitution has been satisfied, and that the court finds the sealing is, serves the interest of justice. Those are the three that you're gonna see some version of in each one of these categories. So the next one's the top of page 12, subsection C. So these are qualifying predicate misdemeanors. Um, so except as provided in subsection G, which is DUI, um, the rules here are that, so in the previous one for non-predicate misdemeanors and drug possession, you remember it was three years. For qualifying predicate misdemeanors, um, it is five years. Um, and the conditions are the same. Um, the person has satisfied the judgment. Um, uh, if there's a subsequent offense, the date on which the person satisfied the judgment for the subsequent offense, whichever is later. So, um, and then the last, uh, the restitution provision, and then the top of page 13 that the court finds that it's in the interest of justice. Next one is top of page 14. These are offenses that are no longer prohibited by law. Um, so uh, for these, um, that it has to be that the petitioner has completed any sentence or supervision for the offense and any restitution and surcharges uh, were satisfied, but there does not have to be that third piece where the court finds that it's in the interest of justice. It's no longer uh, an offense uh, in Vermont. And so that criteria is not part of this. There's a subdivision two, and this is to address, I, I, I'm guessing um, that this was added because of the, uh, the change to the cannabis laws. So uh, you recall that when you did legalization for an ounce or less, um, there was a little bit of a tricky part there in the sense that be prior to uh, when you did decrim of an ounce or less, it used to be that uh, it was two ounces and under that was a misdemeanor. And then you wound up decrimming an ounce or less and then legalizing an ounce or less. And so somebody could have an older misdemeanor conviction for possession of cannabis um, and you wouldn't necessarily know if it was half an ounce or an ounce and a half. Um, and therefore, just by looking at the, the criminal history record, you have to go into the affidavit and look at the affidavit with regard to the amount. Um, and so in that particular circumstance, it would be the petitioner's responsibility to establish that the conviction was based on an ounce or less um, and therefore that the, that the offense for which they were convicted is not currently an offense anymore. Barbara? Thanks. Um, so Michelle, the section that you just went through of ones that are no longer a crime. I'm confused about why we would still make people pay the fines and the fees if it's no longer a crime. And maybe that's not a question for you because you were doing what was asked of you, but, but that, that just yeah, let's, funny. I'll know that that's a good question. Oh. Yeah, I'll note that down. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Martin. So this, 
I guess I'm trying to understand how subsection 2A and B work together. That also confuses me a little bit. Why does the person under 2A, you know, what would it entail? Do they just have to show that I was charged, I was, uh, I was, that's uh, great, whatever, uh, phone guilty uh, for hold, having one ounce or less? The rebuttable presumption in subsection B says that, all right, if the charge said one ounce or less, now under A, don't I just have to show that that's no longer, you know, just point to the law? I, I'm just trying, I'm just confused by how 2A and B work together. And maybe that's not for right now, but. but. I think that this was, a, a, again, this is something that came from your last version. Um, so I wasn't there for the discussion, but I, the way that I would read it and understand it is that, so again, if you're just looking at, you know, the conviction record, you're going to see the person had a, you know, let's say a, a, a 2009 conviction, misdemeanor conviction for possession of cannabis. Right. And so, um, because, uh, and, and therefore, if somebody is going to be petitioning to have it expunged, they would have to offer proof that they have uh, that, that that conviction was based on an amount that is no longer criminal. And so they would have to provide information, let's say, from the uh, law enforcement's affidavit or whatever the charging documents were, whatever is contained in the record that said you know, this amount of cannabis was seized from the defendant, and therefore this is evidence of the violation of, for misdemeanor cannabis, so that they would have to kind of provide that information to show that the amount that they were alleged to have possessed is an ounce or less, not between an ounce and two ounces, which is still criminal. But when, when subsection B is it's saying it's a rebuttable presumption that the amount in the affidavit of probable cause is what the person was convicted of. So it's, it's saying on the one hand, it's a rebuttable presumption. So if it's rebuttable presumption, the, the defendant or whoever's trying to be, do the expungement isn't the one that's supposedly rebutting that. That would be presumably the prosecutor who doesn't want the expungement to occur, right? Right. And I don't, again, I don't know why those two, I, I, I would read it as saying that the, that the petitioner has to have, be providing the information that was in the affidavit of probable cause. Like it's there, like when they petition that they have to provide that information to the court that says, see here, I, I, I only had a half an ounce on me and that's not illegal anymore, rather than just petitioning and saying, I want to expunge this misdemeanor, but not including in their petition the information. And okay. that if the petitioner files the affidavit with their petition, then there's a rebuttable presumption that that's correct, you know? And okay. all right, I got you. That's so, how so, I'm reading it. But again, yeah. I don't know how this language was originally crafted. <laughs> so, well, they can't just come in and say, hey, I was convicted and it was less than an ounce and look at the law says it's less than an ounce. They rather than make the uh, whoever might be opposing that uh, petition for expungement or sealing, I should say at this point uh, to go and show that, oh no, it was two ounces. This person has to bring in something. We're putting the burden on them to bring forth the paperwork. Exactly. So that so that the court has the information from the get go when they receive the petition that the that the petitioner has set has shown evidence of the fact that it was only half an ounce. Okay. Thanks. I have a question. Uh, I mean, it, isn't one to two ounces a civil penalty now? Possession of cannabis. So how does that, I thought that's part of why we did that was actually to make the expungement pathway clearer around cannabis. And I'm looking at the statute and it does define one to two over one ounce and up to two ounces as a civil penalty. So how does, it's not a criminal, I mean, I guess pri if it's a, it's, if it's an earlier criminal, charge but it's so i'm just trying to understand how that intersects because i thought expungement was a big reason we made that kind of technical 
change. Well, it, it, it's, kind of, you know, it, it's embarrassing that I don't remember that because I, I wrote that, but uh, there's so, been so much cannabis stuff over the years, it's all starting to blend together. But I would say if you look at subdivision two um, and you see an amount that is no longer prohibited by law, um, the fact that it's a civil offense, it's still not, it's still not, um, it, it's still prohibited. Right. It's just not, it doesn't create a criminal record though. But anyway, it might be worth just, we should look at the, how those I don't things. don't know the policy like intent. Bit. Yeah, I'm not sure of the policy intent originally behind this, so. I think that was part of, part of it was to make those the the just misdemeanor cannabis possession convictions period more readily expungible and so we we made we sort of decriminalized but retained civil penalties for that one to two ounce amount but anyway I we can keep talking about that. I mean, I would read this as, and again, I don't know where it came from, but you know, the fact that it says in an amount that is no longer prohibited by law or for which criminal sanctions have been removed. So criminals, if criminal sanctions have been removed for an ounce or less, but between an ounce and two ounces, it's still prohibited by law, even though it's a civil offense, it looks like this mm -hmm. is saying that you can't, that you know, it, it's only the ounce or less that's eligible. That's how I would read that. So that might be something for us to think about as a committee, just as we move forward through this, because I th think we had, yeah, anyway, I don't want to belabor the point, but we can keep looking at it. And I don't know, I don't know if, if anyone remembers, but with the changes that, um, that you guys had in S7 that this is based on? Did, did the administration um, submit a, a draft or a list or a memo that had, like some of the things that don't seem that familiar to some of you in here, but even though it was a judiciary draft, I'm just wondering about, I can try to track that down if anybody re recalls, like if changes were made based on administration, an administration proposal. They definitely did issue a memorandum citing some of their concerns, but I think most of the, the drafts that we looked at in S7 in response to the administration's concerns were crafted fairly closely with the attorney general's office, is my recollection. Okay. I'll see if I can go back on and through the committee webpage and see if I can track something down so I can kind of see what exactly the administration was proposing or 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 opposed to and we can try to understand some more of where this came from. Um, but these weren't these weren't new decisions by justice oversight or whatever. It was just picking up where House Judiciary left off last year. So next, moving on to qualifying DUI offenses. Um, so for those, um, as we already mentioned, doesn't apply to um, CDL. Um, here, the time period is at least seven years have elapsed since the date in which the person satisfied the judgment. Um, you'll see subdivision two, these things haven't, uh, changed much. You'll see that it's still the same that at the time of filing the petition, the person has only one conviction for DUI and the person has not been convicted of a subsequent offense since the person was convicted of the, of the DUI. Um, and, and that's just a, that's just a, tweak of the of the terminology. Um, third one is that any restitution's been paid in full and fourth that the court finds the stealing of the criminal history record serves the interests of justice. Just jump in with uh, another 
point of clarification, maybe it's a language, just uh, that at the top of the page there, it has, unless the court finds that ceiling would not be in the interest of judgment of, of justice. And then this, that subsection four says the court finds that the ceiling of the criminal history, it seems like that's a little redundant. Um, oh, yeah. And I, and, and I think that same thing happens in the next provision as well. But if they're going to rewrite the whole thing, you know, you'll correct those kinds of things. Well, I, th I, th I think you're making my case for me there. I, I, I'm I trying appreciate. Like that. I want to, and I will tell you, uh, I got, I got the stamp of approval from Bren too to just throw it all out and rewrite it. Okay. She was supportive of that as well. And but in talking with her, we thought maybe we just start with uh a an updated version of where house judiciary left off last year and get people comfortable with it and then um and then i can rewrite the whole thing once you've figured out the policy that you want so oh, good um so next we move on to burglary into an occupied dwelling committed when the person was 25 years of age or under um and so those are eligible um uh after 10 years um, and the person has not been convicted of a subsequent offense, restitution has been paid and the court finds it's in the interest of justice. Next category are the qualifying property offenses as well as the selling, dispensing or transporting regulated drugs. So these are the, the felony offenses. Um, and you'll see the top of page 18 um, grants it if at least seven years have gone by since the person satisfies the judgment. If the person committed a subsequent offense, the date on which the person satisfied the judgment for the subsequent offense, whichever is later. So the person could have been convicted of something completely unrelated at another time. But as long as they have satisfied that judgment, then you start ticking off seven years from that date. Um, any restitutions paid and the court finds that ceiling is in the interest of justice. Um, so you see subdivision two there on line 14, prior to granting a petition for a violation of burglary, uh, the court has to make a finding that the conduct underlying the conviction didn't constitute a burglary into an occupied dwelling. And the petitioner has to bear the burden of establishing that fact. So next I'm gonna move on to, to the effect of ceiling. So section three. Um, so I'm not gonna go over just the basics because I think you guys are well versed in what ceiling generally means and that it's not something, once a record is sealed, it's not available to the public. It's something that is, is kept confidential. However, with some limited statutory um, access um, by certain persons. Um, so we're going to go down to, um, let's see. So subsection C, so exceptions um, to ceiling. So uh, what you have here starting on page 20. So the first one is that an entity that possesses a sealed record may continue to use it for any litigation or claim arising out of the same incident or occurrence involving the same defendant. So that is unchanged. Subdivision two is uh, changed and that's probably um, uh, the biggest change and the one that folks were most concerned about. So you see that the, the struck language starting on line four is that a criminal justice agency may use a, rec a sealed record um, without limitation for criminal justice purposes. Um, uh, and so that is gone. That's out now. Um, the new subdivision two is that for sentencing and subsequent offenses, the court and parties in a criminal case shall have access to sealed records as follows. So, and this is going according to the little groupings that we have up above. So for non-predicate misdemeanors and offenses that are no longer prohibited by law, um, they would have access for three years. Okay, so... Um, I have a question about that one before you jump ahead. And this is a little more substantive, I think. Um, can can, can non-predicate, uh, not, I'm not going to try to say it. Can those misdemeanors, can they actually be used for sentencing and subsequent offenses if they're non-predicate? I mean, are misdemeanors, is that the kind of thing that, that a prosecutor can get into evidence 
I mean, I maybe I'm just wondering. I, I, again, I um, so I don't know the reasons as to why they feel as though that information would be important. I'm guessing is that they're just looking at it holistically in terms of person's prior criminal history record, in terms of sentencing, maybe for that that new offense. I, I don't know. Um, so I think that would be a good question for the witness about yep. why it's important for them to have information about non-predicate misdemeanors for sentencing on subsequent offenses. Um, I think generally what I tried to do on this provision, and it's not identical at all, but I looked at um, what was submitted by Legal Aid in terms of its suggestion. I mean, it's they were their suggestions were very different in that they wanted all offenses to be eligible essentially so their cat so they don't have the same categories but i was trying to look at some of trying to use the categories that you have in here and and compare them a little bit to the timelines and the reasons that legal aid uh kind of put forth for um, for access to sealed records and tried to kind of combine the two and it's apples and oranges, so it doesn't quite go together, but um, that's how we kind of wound up with what you have here. All right, question for later, thank you. Yep. Um, next one is qualifying DUI offenses. They would have access to that for seven years. Burglary into occupied dwelling when the person was 25 years of age or under, they would have access for 10 years. And for qualifying felony property offenses and selling and dispensing drugs for seven years. So again, that's for sentencing and subsequent offenses. Page 21, subdivision three, uh, Department of Corrections um, should have access to sealed records for the purpose of conducting risk assessments and making supervision decisions as follows. Uh, misdemeanors and offenses that are no longer prohibited by law for three years, qualifying DUI offenses for seven, burglary into occupied dwelling for 25 or under for 10 years, and uh, property fences and selling or dispensing drugs for seven years. Subsection D, um, exceptions for dismissed charges. So prosecution should have access to cases dismissed without prejudice for three years in case they want to bring back those charges. Uh, prosecution may object to the loss of access at three years by proving that the loss of access would pose, quote, a significant risk to public safety. And then that's it. Those are the only exceptions. Um, so it's for essentially for DOC, for sentencing, and for prosecutors being able to bring back a charge for a case that was dismissed without prejudice. I did have one question, but uh, um, I think my hand went up first. I don't know, but I'll go ahead. It's, so so I, I believe in the past we've had some opportunity for uh, access to sealed records uh, by court order, specifically by uh, researchers. And I know that the very last section has something about research entities, but that doesn't have to do with the sealed records. Is that something that we've lost in this? Or is that something that we could still also have as an exception, or at least, you know, propose that as an exception? I mean, I'm thinking of work that, for instance, Crime Research Group does and uh, looking back at past records is something that could be helpful in understanding disparities among different counties, et cetera. But I was pretty sure that I thought at a previous draft or a previous iteration of what we've done in this, that a research entity by court order would be able to access sealed records. Am I remembering, do you remember that Selena? I'll ask, cause you've really been involved in this as well. Sounds familiar, but I, I I don't know if that was something we actually enacted or if that might have been in that more expansive version of S7 that we didn't move forward, Martin. Yeah, I, I mean, it's something I would like to at least have as a possibility for discussion. Uh, you know, that limited purpose, purpose by court order that research entity could get access to sealed records.
Right. I think I don't think that there was any if it's if it's not addressed in here or somewhere else in existing law that we didn't change in there. I don't think that there was an intention or I don't recall here in Pennsylvania to eliminate that. So I'll go back and see. It may just be an oversight, something that's not addressed in here. And so um, I'll take a look. It may exist elsewhere and be untouched. So let me get back to you on that one. Right, thanks. Yeah, I, I thought it was existing law. But, but yeah, no, thank you. Um, we did a good clarification on that. Um, let's see, Barbara and then Selena. Actually had her hand up first, I know. Anyway, so just wanted to be sure. Um, so two things, I, I feel the need to say, and this is not a walkthrough thing, but I'm having a hard time with us doing expungement right and calling it sealing. And so I, I know this is just a starting point. Um, so I want to say that the other piece that's not in this bill, and I don't even think we talked about it ever, but I know at least one state has it, is um, penalties or fines or something for people who um, violate somebody's right to have their record expunged, like sharing information inappropriately or hurting the person that we're trying to help. And I'd love to see us consider putting something in here so that it's not like, oops, I'm sorry, that sealed record. I don't know how it fell on your desk and you got to see that before X. But, but it, I just think that it's going to be important to talk about that too. Thanks. Barbara, you'll be happy to see section four then. Oh, good. <laughs> Yay. Um, so if I, I can't get ahead. for a second, it's just that I did add a, a new section in there for unauthorized disclosure. Um, I wasn't sure what kind of penalty folks would really want or whatever. So I just for as a placeholder, a civil penalty of not more than a thousand dollars. So um, there is something in there and we can work with that. To find Thank you, Michelle. Sure. <laughs> Should I jump in with my question? Yeah, please. Sorry, I couldn't get my to mute. Oh, I'm mute oh, quick no. enough. So yes, please. No worries. Uh, no, it's hard to see when we're all on the side like that. Um, this might be more just a question for witnesses, but I I'm curious about um, you know when we look at how we've constructed ceiling in the past. These are more limited forms of access to records, the records for law enforcement that are proposed in this draft, but they're, they also provide a lot more access than law enforcement have historically had to expunged records. And I'm just wondering if justice oversight, I know in the past, like the stakeholder group that worked for a long, long time through the sentencing commission on the expungement proposals that we've been looking at over the years um, really did a deep dive into sort of how much access other states allow to sealed and expunged records. And I don't know, was that part of the discussion? I mean, I think Michelle, you're sort of saying you just created a starting point here and kind of used the logic of legal aids memorandum as a little bit of a framework for that. Um, but I didn't know if justice oversight or there'd been any look at sort of just how much access other states do and don't allow to these kind of categories of records. Justice oversight did not get into that. I do recall that the state's attorneys did offer their own take on, you know, how that's addressed in, in other jurisdictions and other states in terms of whether other states expunge or seal and I don't recall if there was then kind of a drill down into how much access and by whom um, but that's certainly you know something we can you know try to reach out to NCSL or or someone on to, to, to see if you're interested in in what most states do 
but I, I don't have that information currently now. Yeah. yeah, I think that might be helpful because it is, um, it definitely is a pretty substantive change, I think in some ways that's being proposed, so thanks. Ken? Hi, hi, Michelle. Um, so with the uh, cannabis now being changed, if they were charged under a DUI with this level of the cannabis, would, would that now also go away? Um, for a DUI, so the fact that uh, possession of an ounce or less of cannabis is legal doesn't make it legal for somebody to be high and drive. And so um, whether you're intoxicated by alcohol or by cannabis or heroin or whatever it is. And so they're, they're not really related. So the DUI would provision would be unaffected by legalization. So DUI is simply that you are impaired by alcohol or drugs. Um, doesn't matter if it was a legal substance that impaired you or an illegal substance that impaired you. Okay, thank you. So I, I got a couple more. So this bill or, or whatever we're calling this right now, this here, whatever is on here for listed offenses, um, we're doing away with the expungement part of it completely and just going straight to sealing. Do, am I understanding this correctly? Yes, but you have to look at it, at this definition of ceiling is really kind of a, uh, a combination of ceiling and expungement, because what happens is the record will get sealed for a certain amount of time based on, you know, those subdivisions we were looking at. So three years, five years, uh, seven years, 10 years, right. That, that certain folks would have access to that sealed record. And then after that time period is up, they don't have access anymore. And it is essentially expunged, except, and it'll just be on that index that would then, and then arguably researchers could have access to it. So it's still kind of in some ways, you know, a, a combination system of sealing and expungement, because while they're sealed, there will be limited access for a certain period of time based on what type of crime that is. And then those folks won't have access to it at all any longer. So if so, remember we we're talking about, you know, court can have access for sentencing, but they only have access for a certain number of years to that sealed record, and then they won't have access any longer. So let's just um, jump up to this unauthorized disclosure, like. Um, Somehow or another, uh, my wife and I, we were talking in, uh, the other night, and it was about that Michael, I think it was Mike Jakes from Randolph that killed his niece or murdered his niece. And he had a record expunged or a crime expunged from years ago, which I didn't, I, obviously, I didn't even know what the word meant then. But then I... I wonder if that record wasn't expunged, if the guy ever would have been able to get to the point of what he did, which I'm, I, I guess I can't ask that or say that, but um, in all this expungement, stuff like that goes through my head. Um, but going back to the unauthorized, like the, the, the only reason why I know about that is it, it's on it's on the internet. I mean, that's where I caught it. So it's not really unauthorized because that's where I found it, right? Correct. Right. I actually wrote the re the report on the Jake's investigation for the legislature, and and I think you're talking about um, Jake's had a had a deferred sentence for one of his offenses. Was my recollection? He had a juvenile record which we had no access to, and then the deferred sentence. And then a deferred, if you, comp if you successfully complete the terms of probation for a deferred, then the record is expunged. But, um, but 
you, uh, you know, as a member of the public reading a legislative report or reading about it in the paper, things like that, you would not be subject to this penalty because um, you're not disclosing sealed criminal history record without authorization. Um, so this would be specifically for people who are holders of the record, um, who have access to that sealed information, who then uh, disclose that um, outside uh, the permitted reasons. But no, you you talking about it, you hearing about it from someone in the community, or you reading about it on the internet or whatever it is, that's not what this is geared toward. Okay. Uh, thank you. And, um, and you're right, I did read your name. And, uh, um, and, and I do hope that that is, it is permissible for you to rewrite this because uh, it needs work. But thank you. Lisa. Yeah, thank you. And uh, just a quick question, Michelle. I was reading through, and forgive me if I missed it. Um, I had to step away briefly. But does this do anything to make the current sealing process more comprehensive? Um, it came to my attention this summer um, that even if a record is sealed, if there is duplicates of that record outside of um, the judiciary that are still within state government, they're not considered sealed. And that to me is a massive flaw. And I'm not, I, I didn't know that of this issue last session, like I said, I, I kind of came up to it this summer. Um, but I couldn't find anything in this draft that really addressed that. And when we're talking about unauthorized access, there are copies of records that are reported to other state agencies and other, other departments within state government outside of the judiciary that are not being encompassed when a record is sealed and they certainly wouldn't be encompassed um, after that time period has lapsed and that record would be considered expunged. So I'm really, really nervous that we are not being holistic in our approach and that there are, there are sorry, um, kind of cracks that some things are falling through here. Apologies for the squeaky toy if my dog's not respect Zoom that well. So, uh, so I hear what you're saying and, and I would say we sh let's look at the existing statute and whether or not um, it needs further clarification with regard to the communication uh, between entities that possess the records. So my understanding is that when a record becomes sealed, it's sealed across the board. And it, it's not like that you, it's sealed just with the, with the judiciary and, but that if somebody wants to go to their local uh, state's attorney's office, they can somehow get access to that. Um, that's not the intent here. Um, if there needs to be some clarification on the process of how that works, then, um, then we can certainly do that in the legislation. But I'll, I'll need to take a look and see kind of, you know, what we've got in statute and what's happening on the ground and if, they're the same um, and whether or not we need to add a little more detail in there. But the intention is certainly that it is sealed across the board, that it's not just sealed in one location. Yeah, it, it came to my attention that um, through licensure, people were finding that sealed records were popping up through other state departments. Um, when right. And that just may be an internal, I, I can say from years ago when we, when this committee was working on um, sealing of, of juvenile records, it, it, you know, and this was probably maybe 15 years ago, it, it was a real, um, that, that issue came up as a real concern and that it, it, the records would be sealed one place, but because all these different agencies were not communicating to one another, it, they and there wasn't any follow through or sealing um, policies at local agencies um, that it wasn't being done consistently or um, 
among uh, throughout state governments. And so I don't know, you know, what's happened since that time. Um, but I think that that would be something to uh, hear from witnesses about. So in talking to the court about when they issue um, either a sealing or expungement order, I know that that is sent to VCIC. Um, but the question I would have is then, well, where else, do, who else does it go to and how do they identify all the entities that may um, possess records in order to be able to notify all those other entities that they too must seal their record. And I, I, I'm just not familiar with that process. Yeah, and, and I'd love to kind of work with that because that to me kind of stands right in the way of the work that we're trying to do. And I don't have enough familiarity <clears throat> with um, kind of the processes of notification. And if it is an issue of kind of like siloed communication or if it is an issue of statute. So I, I would appreciate. Uh, your My sense has, o has always been that it's more of a logistical issue, but um, but it, that doesn't mean that it can't, that the logistical issue can't be helped with some clarifying directive language. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, Bob. Yes, Michelle, this is probably uh, questions for the witnesses that are about to uh, come before us, shall we say. But in reference to uh, the sealing or expungement records, I don't know if we can ever do that in its entirety because uh, when someone's arrested, there's four affidavits that are printed up. One goes to the arresting agency, one goes to the court, one goes to the public defender, one goes to well, the defense, and one goes to the prosecutor. But the press still access to all this stuff here. And even after a person may be found guilty or not guilty, the press and the public, anybody goes in on the FOIA request, still has access to this record. So the only entities we are precluding from uh, releasing this information is the courts, defense, the state, and the arresting agency, correct? That's correct. Yep. I mean, and it's very different today. Obviously. You, can, you can Google someone. You would just you see what comes up. There's not only um, with just press reports, but also um, I don't know if anybody's talked to you guys about like record compilers, you know, you there are private companies out there that will aggregate um, criminal justice data and create their own kind of databases. And that exists out there. And um, it could be accurate, might not be accurate. They might have um, things on there that uh, were offenses that were sealed or expunged um, by the state. So you wouldn't be able to obtain that information from the state, but maybe you could from a private organization. So, you know, this, this you're doing basically just what you can do at the state level with regard to the entities that um, that have those those records. But that doesn't mean that that somebody still can't find out about it. Kate. Thanks. Hi, Michelle. It's good to see you Hi. again. Um, I imagine we'll come back to the language of the bill a few times. So I'm going to set some of my questions aside. I feel like my head's spinning a little bit looking at all this language. But I did have a question um, related to on page 20, um, where, so it's under, I guess, what maybe subsection C from page 19 exceptions. Um, there's this section number two on page 19. For sentencing and subsequent offenses, the court and parties in a criminal case shall have access to sealed records as follows. And then it lists a variety of things, non predicate misdemeanors and offenses that are no longer prohibited by law for three years, qualifying DUI offenses for seven years, et cetera, et cetera. Is that saying that essentially for three years, after a record has been sealed for a non-predicate misdemeanor, the court could essentially have access to that sealed record for an additional three years for a subsequent offense? Yes. So it will be sealed in terms of for all the other reasons and that the public won't have access to it. If an employer does a record check, they won't see it. If, if you're applying for a job, you are legally permitted to say, I you know, I do not have a record or I was not convicted of this crime, but for this particular reason for sentencing um, and subsequent offenses, 
um, the court and the parties have access to that sealed record for those time periods, depending on what type of crime it was. So I don't know, Chair Grad, I guess just for maybe just for the record, um, I guess I just want to sort of flag that piece. Um, I think given the testimony we received earlier this morning about the Justice Reinvestment Act and the work of the Kansas state governments and looking at disparities in sentencing, um, I guess I just have some concerns about the length of time that a sealed record could be available for the court for those purposes. Yeah, thank you. And um, I'll ask you to ask our, our witnesses uh, when they testify as well about that. Thank you. Any more questions on this before I move on to um, municipal violations? Okay. So uh, we're on page 23 now, section five. And uh, this is really kind of a placeholder that I, I based it on what you did in S7 with regard to certain motor vehicle violations where you did make uh, certain motor vehicle violations that go to judicial bureau um, expungible. And so I just kind of mirrored that language. Uh, and the concept is that that would also apply for municipal violations. Um, so municipal, so depending on a municipality's charter, they can have their own ordinances and create uh, either civil violations or criminal violations for certain types of offenses. Um, uh, so if it's a misdemeanor, it would already be eligible under your existing system for what you have. So it would be a qualifying offense. Um, but if it's a civil offense where you just have a kind of a civil monetary penalty um, where you're essentially given a ticket, you can decide to admit it on the ticket and send in the waiver amount on the ticket, um, uh, that this would apply to those. So uh, two years following satisfaction of judgment. Um, judicial Bureau shall make an entry of expunged and notify the municipality of the action. Um, and so these are automatic expungements after two years. And again, we're talking about expungement. And I, I don't know how the traffic violation one came about and the decisions around there. So this is a little different that it's not a ceiling, it's an expungement, but you can probably make a policy differentiation as to why you don't need municipal violations or traffic violations sealed, but rather um, you can get rid of them entirely. Um, you'll see subsection B, the effective expungement, um, the entry of the expunged case is only ex accessed by the clerk of the court for judicial bureau. Um, and I did note on here, municipal violations related to zoning shall not be eligible for expungement. So I don't know municipal law. I was going to say, well, I would probably say actually at all. And so um, there are probably just like you did with the offenses above for misdemeanors and felonies. There are probably exceptions to the municipal violations in addition to zoning, whereby municipal attorneys might say, well, we really do need, we need to say that those aren't expungible because they're predicate offenses. And if somebody has, you know, half a dozen of the same violations year after year after year, we want to know that because that's important for us in terms of enforcement. Um, but just this is the general framework for, for what you have for the motor vehicle expungements. And so I just kind of I just set it up for the municipal. And then once you hear from witnesses, we can further refine the pieces here and what offenses might, uh, might not be appropriate for expungement. Martin. So I will give credit to uh, Selena who tracked down this language about uh, court ordering access, but it raises a question to, uh, for me. Uh, it's in it's in 13 VSA 7606, which has to do with the effect of an expungement. And I noticed that 7606 is not part of this bill. Are there going to have to be some changes made to that section as well to comport with what we're doing here? I just, I mean, it talks about 
I mean, it would be the effects of sealing it, uh, presumably. But then again, we have past records that have been expunged, right? So we kind of need that as well. Right. And you still do have, um, you still have deferreds that are expunged. You're not changing that in here. So, and I, and so um, I think there, you know, I didn't repeal the effective expungement provision because there still will be, as you said, records that have been expunged or circumstances where, and there may be continuing expungements either. Um, so, uh, yes, I think once you get a, a, a consistent policy, we'll go through the entire chapter and make yep. sure we true it up everywhere. Um, but Again, you know, I think a lot of this is, as the chair said, is is a starting point for for y'all based on where you left off last spring, combined with the recommendations from Justice Oversight, and and then you go from here, and then we'll true everything up, and I'll rewrite everything. Right. So, so yeah, certainly. Look, I mean, and then also ra raises the issue that uh, the subject of sealed records should have access to the records as well, which I don't think we have clarified here. It, it does have the access to the records when they're expunged, uh, if they exist, or the index at least. But yeah, seven, yeah, 7606 definitely has some of the language I was talking about earlier that I would want to consider uh, for the sealed records as well. So and, and thank you, Selena, for being such a good librarian and finding that. So I will say that um, if you look at page 22, on the special index, and this may be what you were mentioning, Martin, but maybe it went more there is that, um, is that inspection of the sealing order may be permitted only upon petition by the person who is the subject of the case. Um, and, and that's actually the language that I was just talking about now that I see it a little closer. That's the chief superior judge may permit special access to index to the index in the for research, right? That's exactly from 7606. So that is in there. Thank you very much. I probably should have noticed that. There's a lot in there. There's no worries. Uh, Selena. I have a question, but I want to make sure you're well and truly done with your walkthrough. Michelle, before. I am well and truly done. OK. <laughs> um, so I, I've heard a lot of interest, and I share this interest in sort of really looking um, you know, as we did for possession after legalizing cannabis, um, we looked at things around possession to try to make those records more, some of those records more readily expungible. Now we're moving into a phase this year where corporations are going to be able to sell and profit off the sales of just large amounts of cannabis in our state. And so I think there's some interest in thinking about for folks who've historically been charged with, with comparable amounts of sales, like how do we, you know, there's an equity question, right? Potentially about making sure those records are expungible. So under the provisions in this draft, that would look like, because we're not talking about trafficking amounts, that would look like someone needing to wait seven years to be eligible for expunging those records right and if we wanted to if we wanted to change that we'd need to do a carve out that was sort of more unique to the cannabis sales yes yeah okay. Okay. So you could do that. You could uh, separate it out and say can't we're going to treat cannabis differently or we're going to treat the lower levels of dispensing and sale differently than the higher levels on all the drugs or just on cannabis. We could, you know, we can further refine that, of course, mm -hmm. for just the categories that have been put forth earlier. Yeah, um, I think that's something there's 
there's going to be, I mean, I don't know if we'll hear, hear testimony on that or not, but I've definitely heard interest and in questions and concerns about that. So I think that's something for us to keep thinking about and looking at too, as we move through this. Right. And my understanding from, uh, is that the cannabis control board, um, has put forth their proposal with regard to, um, social equity applicants. And I think that one of the ways you can be considered a social equity applicant for a license is to have actually had a conviction. So I have to think about that because you want them, well, I guess they would have access to their own record because I was gonna say they're gonna want access to the record to be able to show for licenses as, which is the exact opposite of usually what you would want. <laughs> right. Right. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, everybody. And I've been um, I've been taking notes of, of everybody's uh, questions, and um, certainly uh, well, a lot of testimony. Amber has sent this out to many, many people <laughs> um, who will also be um, invited to testify. So. Um, so we will go through it. And like I said, it, it's a starting point uh, for discussion. And uh, so I appreciate your, your thinking about it and continuing to think about it. But uh, this is a very important uh, issue to me. And I know it's very important to the Senate. And uh, we did want to uh, keep working on it and move further um, than uh, what we passed in S7. I hope we can. I hope we can do that. So, and thank you, Michelle. I know this was <laughs> very, very heavy lift, and uh, it would be great to have it rewritten. Do you want me to start working on a rewrite now? I mean, I'm happy to to do that. I I just kind of didn't want to throw out all the work that had been done last spring, and I, I didn't want to be too forward with that, but. I can start just rewriting it as a as a clean, you know, just repealing all of that stuff and starting out everything clean language underlined new. Um, it's up to you. Yeah, if that makes sense from a, from a drafting standpoint, and and the if it's easier for you, I'm you know, I just well, want to be sure because then you can't really see the new language exactly next to the old language, which some people, uh, you know, might not like, but I think it'll be easier to read for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's hear from Coach and Celine. Yeah. Based on the questions and the way they've been asked and just this read this afternoon, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> why waste the time uh i think we just need to uh, uh and there seems to be agreement uh, at least that i've noticed uh that you know having that clean copy uh to start with uh so we can grow it from there makes sense i was gonna say i agree but i think um not to make more work for you, but I think sometimes what has been helpful when we're really just looking at the language really new is to have some kind of table that side by side. what the yeah. real change is. Um, we've we've done that before. A lot to, yeah. That's a little, I will say that's a little harder in terms of the table because the um it's just two apples to oranges. Because there's so many variables in each thing. Do you know what I mean? It's not just, you, you can't just be like, have two columns and be like, it's here now, it's here, there. Um, I know, I remember one time when I was reporting this, the an expungement bill for the first time, Brian gave me a flow chart because there's a lot of, we've looked at expungement, but just like you noted with deferrals, there's like in juvenile cases, there's a lot of points where there's expungement eligibility like there's many more pathways than we've even fully discussed I think in this committee at times and anyway I just remember she gave me this flow chart of all the 
possible expungement <coughs> at one time. And I was like, whoa, this is a lot. So I feel you, maybe a table is not the right, maybe we just, those of us who want to get into it just need to really have the current law in hand as we're in the discussions. Yeah, let me let me take a stab. I'll look at, you know, just kind of starting to rewrite um, some of the main sections, plain language, get the concepts and reorganize it. And even if you decide not to go with that as the official version, I think it might help you get your head around the policy better. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that'd be really helpful. I'm also thinking about, um, so this, this version is out there and witnesses, I, wanna, I also wanna make it, um, you know, best for our, our witnesses. So, and I don't know what your timing, just sort of thinking out, out loud here, but in terms of the rewrite and yeah, what, you, what, what, what will we ask? Do you know when you're gonna take it back up next? Um, next week, uh, my hope, uh, we haven't done our scheduling yet. And we, uh, so my hope was to do it Wednesday morning. <coughs> so the policy let me let me see how far I can get and yeah. if I can get something done you know maybe by end of day Monday you know I can I can try that and and I'll let you know if that's unrealistic okay great but the policy yeah. decision will be the same it'll and hopefully just be that much clearer for right witnesses and committee to to discuss yep yeah okay Okay, great, thank you. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Great, great. Well, thank you very much. Um, so I don't know, uh, well, actually, I guess we can go online. I'm just gonna talk scheduling meetings. So, so we can adjourn and go, uh, go off YouTube.